Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you made a decision to worship with us. This is the Lord's Day, and we send a special greetings to our visitors. We ask that each of you sign the friendship pad that should be at the end of the pew, that we might have a record of your visit with us. A lot's happening in the life of our church. Uh, the first thing that uh, I want to call on to you is what's happening on Saturday, and uh, please come on up. Dave Duncan is going to talk about what's happening on Saturday. Uh, you guys probably know we got the camp work day next Saturday. Starts at 8. We got something for everybody. I don't care what your skill level is. You can come out, whatever you're comfortable with, do. If you've got a chainsaw, haven't used it in a while, bring it out. We got a lot of tree limbs that we need to cut up. So I'm having, we're having smoked pork and chicken for lunch. So bring a side dish if you plan on being there for lunch, and we'll just have a great time. You can come for a minute. Come all day or come for part of it. I appreciate it. And then, what is happening this coming Sunday? Do you know? Heritage, Heritage Sunday and Trunk or Treat. Now, let's talk about the wonderful event of Heritage Sunday. I think every Sunday is a great Sunday to invite a guest to worship, particularly, though, on Heritage Sunday. And so uh, we still have postcards uh, if you would like to invite your neighbor or a friend uh, to the special activities planned on Sunday. Uh, we'll kick off Heritage Sunday with a pancake breakfast in the East Dining Room from 9 to 10.30, then we'll have archives tour in which we celebrate the rich heritage of First Presbyterian Church. And then we have our worship service at 11 o'clock, uh, and the bagpipers are going to be leading us in to worship, and that's a great tradition. And they will be also leading us out of worship, out into the world. The function of the bagpiper, uh, for those of you who do not know, was to lead the clan into battle and to lead it home from battle. That's why it's so loud. It's supposed to be loud, okay? It's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, the uh, bagpipers are going to do an extended postlude out on the front lawn of our church for about 15 minutes, maybe 20. And it's a great opportunity also to bring a picnic lunch. Now, if you don't bring a lunch, you're welcome to have a lunch that's going to be provided courtesy of the Lord's Diner just across the street. Uh, but we encourage you to bring a picnic, bring a blanket. Uh, we'll also provide chairs if it's hard for you to... Uh, to sit down and get back up. Uh, but uh, this is going to be a great day for us to celebrate our living history here at First Presbyterian Church. And we invite everyone to stay for Trunk or Treat. We'll be from 1 to 4 o'clock on Broadway. They're going to be closing Broadway off from Elm Street all the way to 2nd Street. And so as you can see the uh, insert in the bulletin, there's a lot planned for Trunk or Treat. And we, it's for everyone. And I'm hoping uh, that you'll want to take advantage of that and also invite family and friends and neighbors as well to stay for the Trunk or Treat event. And then finally, uh, uh, we have a minute for Thanksgiving that we would like to have Kenny Lewis. Uh, he's requested an opportunity to, to share uh, a few words to us about what he has learned in the past several months. Thanks, Doc. Good morning. Most of you know uh, Kenny and I had a little mishap last June. And the rumor is, is that we lost everything. We did, in fact, lose the house and all the contents, but that's far from everything. And this church is a prime example of that. The love, prayer, and caring expressed by our church family is everything, and we did not lose that. The shower of concern was expressed was almost inexpressible, mostly because words will never be enough to say how grateful Candy and I are to be a part of such a loving family. We are happy that due to the church, we are not only able to get by, but we have everything we need. Hallmark does not even print enough thank you cards. Everyone who has taken a part of our recovery shown un was shown by unselfish giving. Last week, Brent mentioned in his sermon that healing can be immediate 
or it can be a process. Candy and I are now going through that process. He also mentioned that the response to that is thanksgiving. And we are giving thanks to and for all of you. May God continue to bless us all. Thank you. And now for those who are able, please stand for the call to worship.
Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. God of unchangeable power, when you fashioned the world, the morning stars sang together, and the host of heaven shouted for joy. Open our eyes to the wonder of creation, and teach us to use all things for the good, to the honor of your glorious name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We learn in 1 John that if we say that we do not sin, we are self-deceived and strangers to the truth. But if we confess our sins to God, God who is just and faithful will forgive us of all wrongdoing. With that wonderful promise in mind, let us use the prayer of confession printed in our bulletin for our confession to Almighty God. Let us pray together. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
hear the good news. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is past, finished, and gone, done away with. Behold, all things are new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Since God has forgiven us in Jesus Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord and Savior be upon you. Please share that peace with one another. Good morning. Good morning. Little, little did I know I wanted to have you guys come over here. So, so Victoria, can I have you slide on over? And you can stand up if you want to. We can be wiggly and stand up. This is a big, a big, what would you call this thing? Anyone know what this is treasure called? Box. Okay, kind of looks like a treasure box. It could be a chest. I'm going to need you guys to stand up here and come look at it with me. What's it made out of? Wood. Okay, it's made out of wood. Can, can you see some different carvings on there? What do you, yep. what, what, church, what shapes? Okay, you see a church? Fire. Fire? The uh, world. Earth. Earth. Okay, do, do you know what continent this is? I know. What? Um, Africa. Good job, Africa. Okay, is there another one way up there? Can yeah. you see? A hand. Okay, a hand. Great. Yep. This is, okay, I'm going to give you a lesson on what we do in the church. We can stay standing up because sometimes it's easier. Okay. So every year, it kind of costs money to run the church, doesn't it? Because yeah. we need to have the lights on, and hopefully you want to pay your pastors and to be able to sing music. And so what people do, you want to turn around and look at all of those people. All of those people get a letter from what's called the Stewardship Committee, and they invite everyone in the congregation to be able to give money to the church. And so all the people out there, once a year, ooh, thank you, turn in what are called pledge cards. And so on these little cards, we won't open them, but there is some information that says all of those people are gonna help support the church by giving some money. And then the, the people who run the church, called the elders, look at how much people are willing to give us, and then we decide how we run the church based on that. Let's sit back down, because the wiggling is, is a little much. Just okay, well, we, can, we can still sit. Good. And so, so this is actually called a Joash chest, and if you stay in service, we'll talk about who Joash is. So Alex, you're going to learn who Joash is. So at the end of the service, I'm going to ask you who he is, okay? Yeah. So you've got to pay attention. Um, so it's called the Joash chest, and that helps us. And all of those pledge cards help us to run the church 
and help us to keep the fire of our, our, our faith growing and help people all around the world. Go ahead and sit down, boys. Even in oh, Africa. Okay, so I have a question for you. Can everyone look at me so I can see everybody's eyes? Yes. Do you think God just cares about getting our money? Or do you uh, think he no. cares? Okay, he what? He cares about everyone. He Good, cares he cares about, about that we, yeah. that yeah. our whole lives are for God, yeah. isn't that? He cares about yeah. the people. He cares about uh, on earth. And so we can, we can help by praying, or we can help by volunteering, or by giving of our offerings to God. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So we'll talk about that another day. That's middle. So let's, let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for all the ways that you have given us stuff. And we ask that you would help us to give back to you, not only with our money, but also with our very lives. Amen. Okay, go ahead back to your mommies and daddies. Yeah, go ahead and grab all your stuff. An image comes to mind, maybe you will agree with this, herding cats. I think you should say thank you to our associate pastor. It's important that we are willing to put up with a little bit of chaos because we're communicating a deeper message that Jesus said, do not prevent the children from coming unto me, for such as these belong the kingdom. Unless you become as a child, you too will not enter the kingdom. And I'm sorry to say that sometimes people get more out of the time with the children than they do with my sermon. But Amy's preaching today. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of the Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you would say to us today. Amen. Our first reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Listen to the Word of God. 1 Peter writes, Come to Him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, He is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy.
Amen. Will you pray with me? Gracious, gracious God, may you take the words of your servant's mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts. May they be pleasing to you, O Rock, our Redeemer. Amen. I have been here five and a half years as your associate pastor. And so for six years, then, I have seen this Joash chest here in the sanctuary. And I've got some questions for you all. Does anyone know which pastor it was that the Joash chest first appeared? Okay, Dr. Walker, Dr. David Walker, great. And how well were you paying attention with the kids? What's carved on here? Okay, Africa. Fire. A hand. And our church building. Okay, great. Does anyone know who was the uh, artisan who put this together? Turk Human, thank you for raising your voices. It's hard to hear up here. So Turk Human um, put this together. Does anyone know why it's called the Joash chest? I love Sarah Hutchinson. Go Sarah, the biblical, <laughs> biblical teacher. There's a Joash in the Old Testament, good one of the kings of Judah, and we'll talk about him a little more. It's interesting in my time here, in my in my six years of seeing the Joash chest out. Beyond some bulletin inserts, I've never heard a sermon on Joash. And so, of course, we're going to do that sermon on Joash today. You know I can't resist some Old Testament history. Come on, people. Okay, so to get to Joash, we need to back up just a little bit. A long time ago, the kingdom of Israel was two kingdoms. They split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah with me. And in that southern kingdom of Judah is where we're going to be. And there were a number of kings in Judah. And it's great because the books of Kings and Chronicles often tell the, a kind of a parallel story of what was going on. And usually there's a one-liner about that king. Either he did evil in the eyes of the Lord or he, did, he walked in the ways of the Lord. So we kind of know in a one sentence whether it was a good king or a bad king. Well, there was a one who did evil in the eyes of the Lord, king named Hazaiah, and he was a king in Judah, and we, we, he was a descendant of the king of Ahab, which was a pretty unsavory king, if that wasn't bad enough. His mother was the granddaughter of King Omri, another unsavory king. And it, it says pretty clearly that King Uzziah walked in the ways of the household of Ahab. So we hearing that kind of hear the, oh no, this is not going to end well. Well, there were plenty of kings in, in Judah that their parents were unsavory, but they chose another path and brought the people back to worshiping God. Unfortunately, King Hazaiah was not one of those individuals. In fact, he was kind of a mama's boy and just kind of went the way of his mama. And things went really bad. And so it was a, a bad time. But in the kingdom of Judah, at this time when ruled by kings, the king wasn't the only one really in power. If you think about Middle Eastern politics, even today, while there are a number of countries that have a king or a president, you and I know that from watching the news that they are not the only one in power. That you often hear about some imams or some religious leaders who exert pressure on the culture, right? You, you're tracking with me? The same was true in, in Judah a long time ago. So your king was important, and often if the king was evil, the people worshiped other gods. If the king was good, the people just wor worshiped the Lord. Um, and so in this case, with King Isaiah was in power, the main priest, Jedidah, is looking at the king and saying, okay, we're not following Yahweh, so we need to do something. And so actually the priest Jedediah conspires with the generals at that time, and they get King Isaiah out of power. And there's some more bloodshed, and then his mom is taken out of power as well. She tries to do a coup, and then they take her out as well. And so you've got Jedediah, this priest, who's kind of moving things, and he puts in control a seven-year-old boy named Joash to be king. Now, 
I've got an almost seven-year-old in my household. Do you think I'd want him to be king? <laughs> It was actually funny in the first service today, there were two nine-year-olds and I asked them if they would want to be king and they both said yes. <laughs> it kind of backfired on me, but anyway, okay. So if I could see my son Obadiah as king, it's actually a great one-liner in both Kings and Chronicles that it says that, that um, king, king Joash uh, walked in the ways of the Lord as long as he was instructed by Jedediah the priest. And so you know the priest was, was doing some good influence. And so um, they looked in the scriptures and they recognized in the Torah that God commanded the Israelites to collect a tax. And that tax was used for the upkeep of the temple. Well, one thing that I forgot to add in, when King Isaiah was in power, the bad king, the temple was pretty much in disrepair because they were worshiping other gods there. Not only that, you know, the stuff used for sacrifices had gold and silver and so they looted a lot of the temple. So it was just in disrepair. So Joash and Jedediah, the king and the priest, together recognized that there was um, a way to collect a tax from the people to do repairs of the temple. And so they went ahead and told the Levite, the priestly class, to go out and collect this tax from the Israelites, from, excuse me, those in Judah, to begin the repair of the temple. Now here's an interesting part. The Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles both have their kind of take on what happened. Kings will blame it on the priests that the priests started embezzling the money. Chronicles points to the fact that eh, the Levites just weren't very enthusiastic in collecting the tax. Who knows what the real truth is? But the bottom line is Joash went into the temple at one point after giving this mandate of let's collect this tax, let's do these repairs, goes into the temple and none of the repairs had been done, and so Jedediah the priest and Joash the king decide we need to do plan B. And so here's plan B. For those who are squirming out there of, didn't she forget to read scripture? Here it is. Thank you. And so here we read from 2 Chronicles chapter 24. So the king Joash gave command, and they made a chest, and set it outside the gate of the house of the Lord. A proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to bring in for the Lord the tax that Moses, the servant of God, laid on Israel in the wilderness. All the leaders and all the people rejoiced and brought their tax and dropped it into the chest until it was full. Whenever the chest was brought to the king's officers by the Levites, when they saw that there was a large amount of money in it, the king's secretary and the officer of the chief priest would come and empty the chest and take it and return it to its place. So they did that day after day and collected money in abundance. The king and Jedediah gave to those who had charge of the work of the house of the Lord. They hired masons and carpenters to restore the house of the Lord and also workers in iron and bronze to repair the house of the Lord. So those who were engaged in the work labored, and the repairing went forward at their hands. They restored the house of God to its proper condition and strengthened it. When they had finished, they brought the rest of the money to the king and Jedediah, and with it were made utensils for the house of the Lord, utensils for the service for the burnt offerings, and ladles and vessels of gold and silver. They offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord regularly, all the days of Jedediah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so you're going to have to help me out on the meaning of this passage. You did hear me pray. May the, may the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to God. And so, what was the purpose of the chest? Great, collect taxes. Good. See, the choir was prompted, so no. Okay, to collect the taxes, but it was interesting that the taxes were rooted not in Joash, but earlier with Moses. Hang on to that fact. Okay, so they collected the taxes. Um, did you catch how the people responded to the Joash chest? Joyfully, enthusiastically. How much it was, it was full and they had to empty it and then it became full day after day. Good, so good campaign. What did they do with the money?
Y'all are mumbling, come on. Okay, they made some repairs, good. And they didn't just do repairs, then they started doing other things. Okay, they paid the people and they made utensils, good. I'm hearing utensils, good. Um, and what was the lasting impact? What, do you think this was an, um, a successful campaign? H how do we know that it was successful? Okay, they kept doing burnt offerings. Thank you. Good. So it was a success successful campaign. Let's go back through these four questions that I asked you all. Thank you for playing along. Question number one. So they put the chest out, and actually there is one difference. Our, our chest should actually be closed with just a hole in the top if it was a true Joash chest. But, but they would put this chest out, and it was a tax. Now, you and I know that we live in a day and age with the word tax is kind of a bad word, and there are lots of people debating on how we should be taxing. Hold that aside for me. The tax that was rooted in Moses' words to the people, it's found in the book of Exodus, and Moses didn't just tell the people about this tax once. He told the people that they were to do this tax twice within that book of Exodus. So it was important to God that they give back to God. Now in some ways, they were happy to give back to God because they knew that they were God's chosen people. And so they willingly gave that tax, that gift, back to God because they were happy to be the people of God. So again, it wasn't just Joash trying to line his own pockets. It was rooted in their identity as being the people of God. <coughs> Question number two, the people responded to the chest. The people rejoiced and they brought their tax in until it was full. Did you catch the generosity? It, one of the commentators pointed out that I looked at that in the book of Chronicles, every time the people are given an opportunity to give or to serve, the people overwhelmingly sign up, give, and are willing to serve. There's a huge amount of generosity. And please note that the book of Chronicles goes from the creation all the way to the end of the exile. So it's not just some small part of Israelite history, it's the whole of the history. So every time the people are given an opportunity, they give those gifts so much and abundantly. Ironically enough, just this past Tuesday night during session meeting, Melinda Sears, one of the ruling elders, gave a devotion, and it was perfect because it was on the passage in Exodus where they're getting ready to build the tabernacle, and Moses puts out the word, we need things to help build the tabernacle, and people start bringing gold and silver, and the part that struck me in that was the, the jewels from their earrings, and they used that to make the garments and to make the tabernacle. In fact, they started giving so much that at one point Moses had to say, I got enough. The people, when they had an opportunity, when they see it's a work of God, they just can't help but be generous. And then this money was used to make those repairs. They hired masons and carpenters, workers in iron, and they made the repairs. And then they had extra. And so they were able to do the utensils. It's interesting that this uh, pledge campaign, your stewardship committee, did a base, a base amount. And then they identified some special projects that you could give above and beyond so that special things could be done in this congregation. And, and we are doing some special things, the community breakfast already, even without the pledge campaign being completed, the community breakfast, the trunk or treat event, all of these are special projects that are going, are show, signs of generosity among you all, people stepping up, um, giving financially, and with your volunteer hours. So pretty much in line with what we see in this passage. And very much the campaign was successful, and we could tell because they continued to offer burnt offerings. Now, 90% of you won't care about this comment, but I found it interesting that there was a, a piece of pottery that was found in the mid-90s, I believe, that talks about this offering of Joash, this Joash chest and the dedication that could be given. It's one of the oldest outside of the Bible evidences to what was going on, that there was a temple in Jerusalem at this time period, just for kicks. 
but the, but the Joash test wasn't just for Joash time. It continued into the future, maybe in a different form. But if you think about it, there's a small story in Luke's Gospel and Mark's Gospel in which Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he points out a woman who's giving the widow's mite, is what it's often called, the, the, the two small coins. And he talks about her generosity. Well, it's believed what she's putting that money in is something very similar to our Joash chest something outside the temple to get um, uh, offerings. And so this Joash chest had lasting legacy. What's interesting, as I said earlier, that while Jedediah the priest was helping Joash, he walked in the ways of the Lord. When Jedediah passed away, Joash started listening to those around him, and the second half of his reign was characterized by wickedness. And so there's some legacy that we could talk about with our Joash test. What started out as a good thing for Joash did not so good when other influences came in. Our chronicle passage and the subject of the Jewish chest poses a challenge for us today. What will be our legacy? What will we be rem remembered for? Is this Joash chest merely a box that sits in our sanctuary once a year? Or are we willing, like those Israelites, to be generous with what we've been given? If I could be real honest, every year when this thing comes out, the one thing that I'm struck with it it's just how big it is. And I'm looking in here, and there are four envelopes in here at this moment. And I think to myself, oh, it just seems so big for our offerings. Could we really be a place that it would overflow, and we'd have to empty it and overflow? The other thing that strikes me about the size of this is that it's so big, I almost feel like I could get into it, and I won't, because I, I considered it, but I won't. But, but it gets me thinking that God just doesn't care about our offerings, our pledges, as important as they are. God wants all of us. And maybe the size of this Joash chest causes me and us to consider, as important as the pledges are, what can we be giving of ourself? How can we be generously giving of ourselves that the legacy might continue, that our faith might burn bright, that those around the world and those in our neighborhood might hear of the good news? Offering is important to God, and God desires all of us. And so as we dedicate our pledges in the Joash chest. May we also dedicate ourselves to be the living stones that Dr. Brent read about from that first Peter passage. Living stones that are built together on the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ. May we dedicate ourselves anew to be that royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's chosen people, that we might proclaim the mighty acts of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. May we come to him, that living stone, willing, like living stones, to be built into the spiritual house and to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It is for God's glory that I make this plea. Amen. Now, as you are able, if you can, stand with me for our ascription of praise. An inscription from Revelation that talks about us as the royal priesthood. To Jesus Christ, who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests of his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.
Please be seated. Our prayers of the people this day is, at, is given by Deacon Kenneth Gabrielson. It is my privilege to share with you a prayer prepared and written by Tracy Dan Silka. Heavenly Father, hear our prayer. Thank you for all the blessings you bring to this day. Help us to be grateful every day for your tremendous love. Help us to pass that love on as you would want and in ways that are pleasing to you, O Lord. Direct our paths and keep us safe. Heal those suffering and pain and illness. Bless their caregivers and doctors and give them strength to do your healing work. Bring friendship and love to those who are lonely, courage to those who are afraid. Feed those who are hungry and homeless. Let them hear the good news, Lord. Keep them warm this winter and help them find a safe place to live. Heal our world, O Lord. Bring peace to all nations. Help our world leaders to come together and find a way to end all wars. Keep our military men and women safe and bring them all home soon. Today we pray for these members of the church. Will Copeland, Tom Starnes, Ann and Michael Moore, Ashley Sandlin, and Joyce Green. May they know of your great love and mercy for them. Please pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. I am Jeff Van Sickle speaking on behalf of your stewardship committee. Many, many, many years ago, Joshua led the Israelites through a dry riverbed and into the land of Canaan. And after he did so, he instructed his people to take some stones from that riverbed and to erect a memorial for what had happened. And so for generations after that, people would ask, well, what are these stones for? And the answer was that God had been great, gracious and he had, out of his abundance, led his people from slavery. In the same way today, I believe that we need to be mindful of God's abundant grace. Sure, life has its rough spots, and yet I truly believe that God's grace is limitless. He is able to make grace abound toward us. He provides for all our needs. He will enable us to abound in every good work. And we are stewards of these resources of God, of God's blessings, guardians of all that God has done and continues to do in our lives. Our responsibility is to manage these unique resources with thankfulness and with thoughtfulness. Today I'm pleased to announce that we have raised about $411,500 out of our basic pledge goal. That's about 55%. Obviously we have a ways to go, but if you have pledged, we thank you with grateful hearts. If you have not pledged, Please remember God's abundance and grace and complete the task of your response to God. We would like to know what pledges we can count on by the end of this month. Your continued faithfulness in helping our church reach this goal is most humbly appreciated. Out of God's abundance, the Stewardship Committee thanks you.
to heal, a time to destroy, and a time to rebuild, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to grieve, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to turn away, a time to serve and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Let us pray. O oh God of restoration, we praise you for what you have done, are doing, and will do in Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit to restore things as they were in the beginning. May these tithes and offerings, may these pledge cards placed in the Joas chest be a new beginning for the members and ministry of First Presbyterian Church in restoring lives and restoring hope as we step out in faith to embrace the future you have prepared for us. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Remember that you are God's living stones, that you are a holy priesthood sent out into the world to proclaim the mighty works of God who has called us out of darkness and into light. And now may the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And may the Lord be with you. And also with you.